Could Spider-Man really stop a train? Spider-Man is a pretty useful guy to just have hanging around. As the ever vigilant protector of his city, he fights crime with synthesized silk and super strength. He can stop supervillains and their henchmen, sure, but can he stop a train? <laughs> okay, come on, we're going. Today's thought experiment comes to us from the much loved and many memed Spider-Man 2. In it, Peter Parker stops a train full of people with nothing more than multiple strands of spider silk and one heck of a grip. Spider silk is spectacularly strong in real life, and you've been asking me to look into this scene for years, so get out your spidey calculators. It's finally time for some spider math. Hit. First, if we are taking a purely theoretical approach here, we need to define what stopping a train really means. <laughs> right on time. Oh, that's the Into the Spider-Verse Oscar. Oh, yeah. If we're gonna be stopping a train, we're gonna be doing physical work on that train, which can also be considered a change in kinetic energy. And so we're gonna have to find some kind of way to transfer the energy of the train's motion into something else, our web. Because the train is gonna be coming to a complete stop at the end of our analysis, this term is going to go away and fall to zero. And so what we are left with is this. Can spider silk, or organically enhanced and mutated spider spider silk do enough work on the train, absorb enough energy such that the work equals the full kinetic energy of a runaway train only using as many web lines as we see in the movie. Whoa! Jeez. All right, so how much kinetic energy does the train in Spider-Man 2 have? Well, if Spidey is swinging around New York City, then each of those train cars is gonna weigh a hefty 38,000 kilograms, and in the movie, I counted six of them. Also, Doc Ock, before he jumps off, makes the train go 80 miles an hour, or 35 meters per second. Whoa! Jeez, what a gallery of rogues, am I right? Okay. Now we don't know exactly how many people Octavius is forcing Peter Parker to save in this scene, but I'm gonna assume that all of the cars are near capacity and everyone inside has an average human mass of 62 kilograms. This adds a full 62 metric tons of people meat for Spider-Man to save. Wait, wait, whoa! Putting all these values together, we can calculate just how much energy Peter's spider silk has to Toby acquire. Woo! Do the math and you get a kinetic energy value for our runaway train of 187 million joules. Now this is obviously quite a lot. It's within an order of magnitude of the kinetic energy a space shuttle landing at 380 kilometers per hour has. Oh no, a viscous ectosymbiotic neuroactive autobligand mutualist. Oh, don't make me get bangs. It looks stupid in the film. Now that we know how much energy we have to absorb, we need to look very closely at Spider-Man's webbing. I'm taking pictures for the bug. The amount of energy a material can absorb while deforming, like stretching, is called that material's toughness. A common way to visualize the toughness of different materials in material science is with a so-called stress versus strain curve. Stress is how much force per unit area some material is subjected to, and strain is how much the material is deforming, compressing, or stretching based on its original length. This is a common stress-strain curve for steel. As you can see in the beginning, steel can be subjected to an awful lot of force without changing shape very much. But at this point, called the yield strength, the steel starts to deform a lot without much change in the force. This is like a steel beam resisting motion and then completely folding. And at this point, the material ruptures. The area underneath this curve is how much energy you had to put in the material to take it and deform it until rupture. This is the material's toughness, and the units work out to be how many joules of energy some sample of material can absorb per volume of stuff that you have before it fails. Failing. Just a sec. Sorry, I um, needed some me time. Toughness is where spider silk is truly spectacular. I'm fine. 
As spiders evolved to fill the catch fast moving objects with strong stretchy fibers niche, their silk developed an impressive balance between strength and stretchiness. As you can see here on the stress strain curve, while steel is stretching and totally failing, spider silk is stretching but taking on more and more stress as it goes on, showing more and more toughness. I guess you know what they say. With great power comes great extensibility. Woo! While the steel in our example may have a toughness of 6 million joules per cubic meter, the dragline spider silk of the golden orb weaver spider, for example, has a toughness of 150, making it 25 times tougher. And this is very important because the toughness of spider silk, real or otherwise, will determine whether or not we can truly stop a train. Speaking of which, hip ho! Okay, so let's get to calculating because we're moving at like 80 miles morales per hour over here. If we divide the kinetic energy of this train by the toughness of the spider silk we are using and divide all of that by the volume of web that Peter Parker uses in the movie, then we can find out whether or not enough webbing is used to transfer all the kinetic energy of the train into the toughness of the spider silk. So now we need the volume of the web. All right, so looking at the movie, the lines actually look like some kind of woven web rope in that each one of the web lines has eight contact points on the surrounding apartments. And Spider-Man shoots out eight of these ropish lines from each hand. This gives a combined 128 web lines. Each one of these web lines looks like it has maybe the radii of a pencil, maybe 3.5 millimeters. And each one of these lines, based on the width of New York City streets, which I checked based on the movie, could maybe be around 15 meters long each. This gives us the volume of our web. And now remember, if this equation gives us one or less than one, it means that we have just enough webbing or more webbing than we need to stop the kinetic energy of the train. And I calculate one, <laughs> three, 13 times too little spider silk. Save me, Raimi! Ah, let's try this again, because if we change a few variables around, we might just pull this off. Ah! Uh, okay, so instead of orb weaver silk, let's try the toughest biological material ever tested, silk from Darwin's bark spider. Hang on, buddy. The silk of the bark spider here is 10 times tougher than Kevlar. And remember, when we plug this into our equation, we want a value of one or less, and that means we have enough web to stop our train. And I get a value of four. Dang! All right, fine. Maybe the movie was taking some Statues of Liberty here. Using our same numbers, how many strands of webbing would it take that look to be the correct size to stop our train? Doing all the same math we did before and using the toughest spider silk available, I get 70. That's 35 web lines per hand. Theoretically now, we have enough toughness to stop the train in Spider-Man 2 because our equation that we set up earlier gives us one and everybody gets one. <laughs> This show and many others are built on nerdy analyses like these, but I don't want to just give you some numbers like they're now canon and some voiceover and call it a day. No, I want to actually learn this stuff with you. So now I'm going to show you just how much our assumptions can change our conclusions. For example, if we want Spider-Man to catch a train, but we don't want to have him shoot an absurd number of lines like 70 out of his hands, all we have to do is simply initially assume that the webbing is not pencil width, it is twice as wide. And then our equation pops out a one and you can get the observed number of lines shot from his hand with the requisite toughness. However, if this is the case, then the amount of webbing he has to be holding on to is absurdly large, like holding on to scaffolding. Or we could just simply state that Spider-Man's mutated organic silk has a toughness higher than anything ever tested by humans. Pop this into the equation and we get a one and the observed number of web lines in Spider-Man 2 works. However, this is higher than anything we know of and then doesn't really fit with material science. You see, when you do this kind of thing, you have to balance fiction and reality, assumptions and variables, and come to an acceptable conclusion. And when you do that, and only when you do that, can you become something of 
of a pop culture scientist yourself. <laughs> Meme it all day, woo! So, could Spider-Man and his silk really stop a train like in Spider-Man 2? Well, theoretically, yes. Using the toughest spider silk that we know of, he could use enough web lines such that they would have enough toughness to absorb all the kinetic energy of that runaway train. However, to do exactly what we see him do in Spider-Man 2, we'd really have to give old Webhead the benefit of the doubt. His web lines would have to be either much thicker than they look or much tougher than anything that we know of. If he did that, then it would push this move into the Spider-Verse of plausibility. Otherwise, it would be close, but no cigar. Because science. And I still want those pictures of Spider-Man! I know we got a little bit meta with how these kinds of videos are made with assumptions and variables and etc. So let me just add a few more for you super nerds. We are assuming in this episode a very, very simple model that the train is no longer accelerating when Peter Parker tries to stop it. It is just coasting, which isn't really accurate. And we did not consider the extensibility of spider silk. It cannot stretch what looks like uh, miles in the movie. Uh, even if spider silk stretched that far, it would still put some deceleration on the passengers. But I did check, even if the spider silk stretches just a little bit within known values, then the passengers would only pull, you know, 20 to 30 Gs while hitting a steel box of death. Thank you so much for watching, Christopher. If you want to suggest ideas for future episodes and keep up to date with everything I and Because Science are doing, please follow us here at these handles. Also, we are now halfway through the science of Mortal Kombat. Three episodes are up, as well as two episodes that are behind the scenes. You're going to want to check them out because things get crushy and bloody and icy and mm, watch it.